Hi there. Today is something easy. A weekend build if you can't call it even that much. This is a frequency counter module from China. The idea to get this came from a comment from one of my viewers. Michael left five months ago on one of my videos on changing the firmware on a five digit counter based on a PIC microcontroller. And while this one here is also allegedly PIC based, I don't have any plans touching its firmware. All I want is a cheap way of measuring frequency into the tenth of megahertz with one hertz resolution and this is what it does. I bought mine from this eBay seller, Violet88, claiming to be in the Netherlands, but the PayPal receipt shows a Chinese contact. Anyway, it did arrive within two weeks. Now, the counter is supposed to be PLJ8 LED made by Sanyan Studio in China, but in fact it's a clone, as probably most PLJ8 LED modules out there. Prices of these modules vary significantly. I bought another one a couple of months ago directly from Hong Kong for less than 10 pounds, and it's also a clone, identical to this one apart from the LED color. That earlier one has an accuracy problem, which is why I bought another one, this one from somewhere else, not going for the cheapest offer. In this case, that strategy seemed to have worked, as this one turned out to be okay. A quick summary of the PLJ8 LED. It has only one input, but two channels, referred to as high and low. The microcontroller can automatically select which channel to use, but you can also do this manually. There is, of course, the clock generator, which determines the accuracy, especially in the long term, of any measurement. Like the original 5-digit peak counter, the PLG8 LED can be used as a frequency display for radios, in which case you would hook this counter up to the IF oscillator of the radio and enter up to two intermediate frequency offsets that can be added or subtracted to read the actual frequency. An external signal selects which of the two offsets to use. I'm not using this feature, so I keep the intermediate frequency set as zero and ignore the IF select. A closer view of the module. We have a 7805 voltage regulator on not much of a PCB area used as a heatsink next to the power socket and a beefy diode which serves as a polarity protection. The large chip is a TM1639 and simply decodes and drives the LED 7 segment displays. The three solder blobs labeled TR and G are probably connected to one of the PIC's serial ports. The PIC itself is on the underside of the PCB right beneath where the blobs are. The 6 pin header connector can supposedly be used to reprogram the PIC. Then we have the crystal oscillator. The 16 pin chip is a SN74HC151, which allows the PIC to select between 8 inputs even though just 2 are used. And finally, we have the input connector and the high channel amplifier with the MB506 prescaler, which is hardwired to divide by 64. The low channel amplifier sits under the high channel on the upper side of the PCB and is completely inaccessible because of the 7 segment displays covering it. Note the bent pins, probably shipping damage. Here is the PIC, also completely inaccessible. The display blocks are also not quite straight, as you can see at the uneven gap between them. Here you can see it quite clear. This, by the way, is my first module, the one that has some quality issues. And another view of the bent pins from the other side. In summary, this is what the visible PCB looks like. The underside contains the PIC and the low channel amplifier. I mentioned the serial port. I did hook up an oscilloscope to the T and R pins and could not detect any signal. So that feature seems to be unused, which isn't a surprise, since as far as I know the real PLJ8 LED neither mentions a serial port nor features terminals for it. Pin 4 of the 6-pin header programming connector serves a double role during operation. 
it is used to select which intermediate frequency offset is to be used. I have not tried accessing the PIC in any way as I have no plans changing the firmware. I marked the four trim potentiometers you find on the PCB. Most importantly for accuracy is this one which allows you to pull the oscillator to exactly 13 MHz. The original PLG8 LED spec boasts a temperature compensated crystal oscillator or TCXO with a drift of just 2.5 ppm. To what extent the clones meet that is somewhat questionable. My first one had an oscillator marked as a TXC130Q05 and I can't get that one to go to exactly 13 MHz as I will demonstrate. The second one used a different oscillator marked PC53 which works fine and as far as I can tell pretty stable. For neither could I find an exact data sheet. I mean TXC makes all kinds of oscillators including TCXOs but their markings seem to be different and there is a PC53 from Fox Electronics but again no exact match. The other three trim pots are for the amplifiers where the high channel has two W3 and W2 while the low channel just one W1. More about these later. The choice of the power connector as a two pin JST type is fine but using the same style for the high frequency gigahertz input is very questionable. The module comes with two sets of cables but you need to be very careful as these have opposite polarity as you can see but will fit into either socket red black for the one I'm holding and black red on the other one. This is the correct cable for power. The PCB is marked plus and minus which marks the red and black wires. If you use the other cable by mistake it will fit fine but you would reverse polarity. I guess the protection diode is there for a reason. And this is the correct input cable for the signal. Its red wire matches the PCB print of a sine wave and the black wire matches the printed earth symbol on the PCB. With the cabling sorted, here is a test of the power consumption. I cover the green display with a strip of plastic to make it easier to read and less ferociously bright for the camera. The red meter shows the voltage and the blue the current. The input of the counter is open so just displays random nonsense. At 12 volts and the lowest brightness the module draws 64 milliamps. I am increasing the brightness level to the maximum which is 8 and unbearably bright. Depending on the number of digits the current consumption is almost 220 milliamp maximum. Let's change it back to a more sensible value of 3 which gives good readability during daylight without burning out your eyes. Slightly below 100 milliamp. That still means the 7805 regulator has to turn 12 minus 5 equals 7 volts times 100 milliamp or 0.7 watts into heat. Far better to run this at a lower voltage. With a level 3 brightness setting the module works fine without any drop in brightness if we reduce the voltage to just 7 volts. With 6 volts it still works but we are now seeing a drop in brightness. So 7 volts and about 75 milliamps is as low as we may want to go reducing the loss in the regulator to just 0.15 watts. Ok, brightness and reducing thermal load is a good thing but only if the readings don't change when running it at different voltages. To find out I feed an accurate 10 MHz signal into the counter and here you see the problem of this module. It is about 5 Hz too low which means its clock is slightly fast even after trying to adjust it. Let's change the voltage up to 15 volts.
The reading does not change. Of course, if this were in an enclosure, the heat of the 7805 at higher voltage will eventually affect the oscillator. For comparison, this is the second module with the same signal. And 10 MHz plus minus 1 Hz is what I expect, and this module delivers. The fluctuation of 1 Hz is to be expected, as the gate is of course not synchronized with the input frequency, so when the gate opens and closes for one second, it may just catch or miss one period of the input signal. I decided to put this one into a little box, but not spending any significant money on it. As the display is blue, I decided to put it into this transparent blue case, which gives a nice touch of color to the boring gray and black of my other kit. I made a quick drill template in Lipo Office Draw, showing the locations of the mounting holes and buttons. The next step is to cut the template out and glue it temporarily to the front plate. Then it's off to the garage to drill the holes. The holes are drilled and I already mounted an old BNC connector as scavenged from some other device. It's for PCB mounting, but it will work just fine with wires soldered to it and a much more appropriate input connector for a frequency counter. The moment of truth. Did I make the drill template accurately? Mounting the module is a bit fiddly, so I speed the video up. But I'm pleased to say that everything fits perfectly for a change. I had some plastic buttons in black and blue to be used as extensions for the built-in buttons. To prevent my button extensions from falling out, I added a tiny drop of glue before inserting them on the built-in ones. This works very nice and I can still remove the module with the buttons attached from the rear. For power, I decided to reuse this old unit left over from a BB monitor that has long been recycled. It's rated 6 volts 250 milliamps, but judging from weight, this is an old school linear supply with a tiny but proper isolation transformer, so it's probably an overachiever regarding output voltage. I'm using my power meter, another of my projects, to test it and indeed it has a power factor of 1, which means it's definitely not a switch mode power supply. The drawback of course is that it consumes 1.3 watts just being idle. As expected, the output voltage is 9.6 volts. The idle voltage of an unregulated linear power supply will always be higher than the full load spec, more so the smaller the transformer is. The question is, what will it drop down to when loaded with a frequency counter? Only one way to find out. Temporarily connecting the frequency counter and the voltage has dropped, but 7.7 .7 volts is right in the area where I want it to reduce the heat on the 7805. I could leave it at that, but the power supply and its caps are at least 15 years old, so it's prudent to check how much ripple is on the DC voltage while feeding the counter. Well, here we have the typical 100Hz sawtooth ripple of a linear power supply with a full bridge rectifier, as Electroboom would say. 154mV ripple on 7.7V doesn't seem too excessive. The regulation of a 7805 is going to filter that out easily. So with that, the counter is kind of finished. I like the way the display looks through the blue box. The box makes it look a little bit like a toy, which, let's face it, is also quite fitting. If you do frequency measurement often and on tricky signals, this counter is not for you. Let's explore it a bit to show you what I mean. The first two settings in the menu are for the IF frequency and I will skip those, just make sure the IF frequency is zero, so it does not mess up the results. The channel selection toggles between A for automatic, L for low channel and H for high channel. You are well advised to avoid automatic as it doesn't really work. I select it for demonstration. Another setting which is kind of semi-useful is the display filter shown as DF. If it's on, all frequencies below 100 kHz are suppressed. 
that stops the display of random numbers when the input is open, but can lead to unnecessary troubleshooting if you forgot that you left it on and wonder why the counter shows zero for a 60 kHz frequency. Here I change the frequency to 100 kHz and everything is fine. Now I change it to 99 kHz and all we see is zero. First thing to check is the display filter. Let's turn it off. That helped, but now we get alternate 99 kHz and some random nonsense in the 400 kHz range. This is a bug of the channel outer setting, which flips continuously between H channel and L channel if you drop below 100 kHz. By manually selecting L for low channel, we finally get the right readout. The counter is specified for 100 kHz minimum, but as you have seen, you can get lower. 50 kHz works, and so does 20 kHz, but you start seeing glitches and below 20 kHz it's getting increasingly unstable like here at 16 kHz with the last two digits uncertain and for 10 kHz with the last three digits uncertain. Now to be sure you can get it to read down to 1 kHz if you carefully tweak the signal shape and amplitude just so, which means this is more a problem of the amp than of the digital part but it's just not usable in practice. Before exploring the high channel, I like to talk briefly about gate time, because it's not always what you might suspect from other frequency counters, and it took me a while to actually understand what's going on here. The counter offers a selection of two gate times. One is always one second, the other depends on what channel you are using. Let's say we have an input frequency of 10 MHz that can be comfortably measured using either the low or high channel. For the low channel it's pretty clear. With one second gate time you get a count of 10 million plus minus one for reasons discussed already. So you have a resolution of one hertz which is the best this counter can offer. You can change the gate time to 0.1 second and it's a real change of gate time. In fact I think it's the only time the gate time is actually changed. With 0.1 second there are of course only one tenth of the pulses to count so we end up displaying values to the nearest 10 Hz and the plus minus count now translates to plus minus 10 Hz. Why would you ever select this mode? The only thing I can think of is if you rather have a fast update rate than resolution, for example in a radio while giving that tuning knob a good spin. Things are a bit different in the high channel. To begin with, everything in the high channel is going through a prescaler, so it's divided by 64. That means, instead of seeing 10 million counts per one second gate time, the microcontroller only gets 156,250, which it then multiplies by 64 before displaying the result. The effect is a resolution of 64 Hz and the plus minus one count equally multiplies to plus minus 64 Hz. When you now switch to a faster gate time, the effect on the display is as if you had selected 0.01 second or one hundredth of a second, but it really only shifts the decimal point of the value shown for one second and rounds the result. It can get away with not changing the gate time because even at the top frequency of 2.4 GHz, the prescaler reduces it to just 37.5 MHz, a frequency it can still comfortably measure using one second gate time. The result is a resolution of 100 Hz. It needs to do that because it needs to drop two decimal places to be able to show 2.4 GHz with just eight digits. Here is the 10 MHz in low channel mode and at one second gate time. Changing to the faster gate time in low channel mode and you can see the drop in resolution as well as the plus minus one digit uncertainty 
happening much faster because of the faster gate time. Changing to the high channel automatically resets the gate time to one second. And though it shows the same 8 digit 10 MHz, you can see the resolution is now 64 Hz instead of 1 Hz. Changing to the faster gate time in high channel mode changes to 100 Hz resolution, but since we are showing effectively a plus minus 100 Hz uncertainty, the actual gate time used for the measurement has not changed. If you have a frequency like 10 MHz, you can select the high side amplifier, but it reduces the resolution. So you don't want to use the high channel until you must, because the 1 Hz resolution drops to 64 Hz resolution. But how far up is the low channel usable? 51 MHz in low channel mode is still alright. But 52 MHz are increasingly unstable and 53 MHz practically useless and jumping all over the place. Selecting high channel and we see the value was indeed a stable 53 MHz. Let's see how the auto selection works. Make sure it's on first. I change the frequency to 20 MHz, no problems. Now 40 MHz, still fine and still in low channel mode. Now 60 MHz, oh boy, total nonsense. Let's see 61 MHz and now it's switched. So the frequency has to be above 60 MHz for the auto switch to high channel to happen. Too bad that the low channel already stops working properly above 52 MHz. The next test is about how it handles overflow of the 8 digits. Starting with 99 MHz, which you can still display at 64 Hz resolution. Now 100 MHz, which should cause an overflow. It does overflow, but not change gate time automatically which you could enable in the original PLG8 LED. Instead, one has to manually select the fast gate time now, one hundredth of a second, so we are down to 100 Hz resolution. In a way that is good, because you can basically get an additional digit if you switch between the two gate times. Now a quick test with roughly the highest frequency I can produce at the moment, 800 MHz and it has no problem with that. Last not least, a quick look at the amplifiers. This diagram is from an English translation of the PLJ8 LED manual, but as far as I can tell, it's still applicable to the clones. We have two separate amps for the low channel and the high channel with both inputs hardwired together. The outputs go to the channel selector chip. The diagram shows the function of the three trim pots I mentioned earlier. W3 is used to adjust the high channel signal output of the first stage amp to the 50 to 100 millivolt the prescaler needs. The output of the prescaler is ECL level and the second transistor brings that to TTL level adjustable with W2. The low channel is very similar but of course has no prescaler. W1 adjusts its TTL level output stage. The front end design is pretty terrible. The two anti-parallel diodes in each channel provide a hard clamping if the AC input peak voltage exceeds the diode forward voltage of 0.7 volts or so, and since they are directly after the input capacitors, the clamping will then completely mess up the signal you want to measure. This effect is worse because both inputs are in parallel. In addition, even though only one channel is in use at any time, the unused channel always adds an additional load on the input of the used channel. Here is the frequency counter perched on top of the scope, which shows the input 10 MHz sign signal for my function generator. Watch the distortion as I increase the amplitude.
now with 1.4 volt peak to peak or 0.7 volt peak, the clamping caused by the diodes in the frequency counter is directly distorting the function generator output. Just to prove the point that the two parallel input amps of the frequency counters are to blame, I disconnect the counter briefly. The signal quality is back to normal and gets distorted again when I reconnect. You can improve the situation a little if you cut the PCB trays connecting the high channel and low channel inputs here and wire the high channel to its own input connector shown here by the yellow line. I have not done that because it's not worth the effort for me. The counter does what I need it for, verifying frequencies from 100 kHz to 50 MHz with at least 1 Hz resolution. As a quick summary, I have tested it and it works fine from 20 kHz to 800 MHz. I suppose it will work fine for higher frequencies too, but I have no way of testing. Stability and accuracy seem to be ok for the second module I bought. The quality out there seems variable, so your mileage may vary. Auto channel selection is not helpful since it switches too late on high frequencies and it messes things up when going below 100 kHz. The most serious shortcoming is the way the amplifier in the counter affects the input signal. A measuring device should ideally not influence the thing it measures. So in summary, it's a fun project for little money and you may even end up with a counter that's half usable as long as you remember its shortcomings. Thanks for watching.